Please take out your Bible, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, we'll get there in a moment. <clears throat> but I'm venturing into risky territory today as we talk about our upcoming election and biblical understanding of how we can properly vote. And I hope that all of you are registered to vote. I hope that you are going to be involved in the voting process. I think it's very important. I think it's not only for us as Christians, but, but you know, know the things they say not to is when you get together for a meal with somebody or a conversation, just don't bring up faith or politics. Am I on? How about now? Okay, we're on. Sorry, I didn't think I touched it after we said that. <clears throat> One of the things you don't want to do, they say, is when you get together with people in a conversation, is to bring up faith and politics. But I'm not only going to do just one, I'm going to do both today, and I'm going to be an equal opportunity offender probably to everybody in this room. And what I have to say is not popular in our culture. It's not even popular for some even pastors to preach on these things, but it's so vitally important that we understand in the backdrop of the Word of God how we're to vote and be involved. So if you disagree with me, don't send me an email unless you want to have coffee and we'll have a discussion together. We'll remain civil and discuss what I share this morning. But I firmly believe that our country is at a fork in the road. I really believe that we're leaving possibly the moorings of our Judeo-Christian ethic in which our country was founded upon. And we need to vote that way and keep our Constitution and Bill of Rights and the things that were established on the path. Or we can go the other way of secular humanism where we take God out of the equation, God out of our government got out of our public square and that we just rely fully on man's wisdom. I believe that's part of the, what we face in this election. We're talking about the soul of America and we need to rely on the direction that God wants us to go because this will affect the generations of Americans to come. It will affect our children. It will affect even our grandchildren. This message is timely because Iowa starts early voting on October 16th and Illinois has already started voting on September the 26th. Let's look at our scripture reading in 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. First thing on your outline, I encourage you to take out that outline and fill in these blanks and think about this, take this home this week and use this as an opportunity to review and pray. But first we see God's purpose for the governing authorities in the church. I want to quickly touch on this first point. We're going to settle in on the third point because that's the main thing of this message. But I want to remind you that we need to understand the relationship between God's governing authorities and his church. This is just a brief reminder of the way the church and state were designed to work together in our country. We see the governing authority's purpose in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, familiar passage of scripture, but let me read it. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. So God has established all authority at every level in our world. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers or stewards or managers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is due owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, 
revenues to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. In these verses, which many are familiar, you're familiar with, it gives us two overarching purposes for our government. First of all, the government is to protect the people from wrongdoing. To protect the people from wrongdoing. The government is charged with keeping our country safe from outside entities that would want to come and attack, pass through our boundaries and attack us to bring harm on the citizens of the United States of America. And the government is charged at the state and local level to keep order and to punish wrongdoers who violate the laws of the land and the communities they live in. Second of all, the government is to promote good in society, as we read in those verses. To promote good, the government is also charged with maintaining moral behavior. And the basis for that in our country is found in God's word. Our laws are based on the laws of England, whose laws were written by Sir William Blackstone. Sir William Blackstone was an evangelical Christian who let his faith influence his works. He was the English jurist who wrote commentaries on the laws of England between 1765 and 1769 that became the foundation for English laws. So William Blackstone believed that human laws were like scientific laws created by God and waiting to be discovered. And so our laws are based on Sir William Blackstone's laws that were established in England. And so because of that, we have a basis or a foundation of Judeo-Christian ethics. The early laws and documents of our country were written based on these things. To complement the governing authorities that God established, the church played a very important role in society at the founding of our country. We see the church's, the church authority's purpose. The church authority's purpose. Now let's be clear. So we think about our founders. <clears throat> Many of them were born-again Christians. But some of them, numbers of them, were deists. Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson. Well, what is a deist? A deist is someone who believes that God created the world, and then once he created the world, he took his hands off of it, he became an impersonal God, and he lets the world run its course on its own by the laws established. A good example would be like a clockmaker. A clockmaker builds a clock, he winds it up, and then he lets it go. He lets it run. And so you had deists, you had Christians, you had all kinds of other belief systems, but mainly we came from a Christian perspective. And so <clears throat> America is not a covenantal nation. We are not like Israel, who God called to be his chosen people. But America is unique and a special nation because the founders looked to God and his word for principles to develop the way we live as Americans. Now, I do not support or purport to be a Christian nationalist. That's one of the things that the media wants to tag on all Christians, Christian nationalism. One ex-user said this, Christian nationalism can be reasonably understood as a movement that seeks to preserve or promote a Christian national identity. Better defined by Dr. Michael Brown in an article called Is Christian Nationalism Dangerous? This definition also suggests that America has a special covenant with God, and so being a Christian nationalist means helping America fulfill its God-appointed covenantal dust destiny. Consequently, it's no problem to wrap the gospel in the American flag since America is a Christian nation with a Christian calling. I do not believe that. We are not you know, a Christian nation that we are covenantal by God. But he did make us unique and with a purpose. And because the founders looked to those things that we already talked about, God is blessing our country. God's desire for America is not to become a theocracy where government and the church are merged together and the church runs the government. The only theocracy that will ever occur that will be fully successful is when King Jesus comes back at his second coming and sets up his rule and reign in Jerusalem for the thousand year reign and on into eternity. The church in America had and still has a big role in setting the culture mores of a community. The church is to produce godly citizens. That's what the founders say. I wish I had time to give you quotes from um, <clears throat> George Washington's second inaugural address. 
and John Adams, one of our presidents as well. From the beginning, they said that this country would not survive if the people were not religious down the road. So the church was to produce godly citizens, citizens who are moral, who follow the laws of the land established by the God-ordained authority of the leaders in government. Citizens were to be influenced by the churches to be, at least at a minimum, God-fearing and those who are Christians to be salt and light in their communities. Citizens who have character, uh, citizens who have character and among whom some will serve for offices in local, state, and national government. So the church raises up godly people, and so those people hopefully will gravitate some to be leaders in the community, in the state, and federal government. The church is also to provide ministries that complement the needs of the governing authorities. The church, hundreds of years ago, took care of the widows and the widowers and orphans and the indigent or the poor who lived among them until the government set up the welfare system. The church established hospitals. The church took care of foster kids and handled the adoption of children before government agencies started and got involved. Somewhere between the 1930s and the 1960s, for a variety of reasons, the church was not as influential as the government agencies began to have, and the agencies of the government began to grow in number. These are just a few of the ways churches took care of communities before government agencies were established. And by the way, churches did a better and a more personal job of meeting needs in the community. So the government was established to protect the people, to support the good in society, and the church was to raise up moral, religious people who respected the rule of law and elected the moral citizens to represent them in the government. That was the design and the purpose by our founders for our country. So the application here is the church and government have their separate, have their separate and unique roles to fulfill God's kingdom work. As I've laid out very simply, and we can go in greater detail, the two complement one another and they need to stay in their lanes to be able to do that successfully. Let's look next at how God uses flawed and sinful people. Sadly, character's not on the ballot for the presidential election this year. Both Kamala Harris and Donald Trump have a lot of moral baggage and other unethical things in their past. And I hear Christians say that they cannot vote for either candidate and they're going to sit out this election. And I got to say that we got to remember that we're not voting for a pastor or a Sunday school teacher to lead our country. There are 90 million evangelical Christians in our country. 40 million sat out the 2020 election. 15 million aren't even registered to vote. That's 55 million people. And if, the, if everyone got involved who were in the evangelical part of our country, they could, and, fo and followed their biblical values in voting, they could determine the election of who is in leadership in our country. And we'd see a drastic change in who the characters are and who would get elected. And I want to remind you that God always uses flawed leaders. Why do I say that? Because all leaders, like all of us, have a sinful nature. We're born with that sinful nature. And so we have to battle that with the power of the Holy Spirit as believers. God uses flawed and sinful leaders. Think about it. David. David was called a man after God's own heart. He said that before Bathsheba, before he committed adultery, before he plotted to have Uriah, the husband, killed. And he said that after that incident as well. Think of Moses. He murdered an Egyptian. And yet God used him to bring the nation of Israel out of Egypt. God used a prostitute named Rahab to help bring down the walls of Jericho. Did you know Rahab is mentioned in Matthew 1 as part of Jesus' ancestry? Saul persecuted the Christians. He held the coats of those who killed the first martyr, Stephen, in the book of Acts. But on the road to Damascus, he saw a light. Christ came to him. He was saved. And he began to minister to the Gentiles, planting churches all over Asia Minor, and wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. So when we look at the 
Two, atop the party ticket, Kamala Harris, Donald Trump, we have to see that they're flawed individuals. But God, in his sovereignty and his work, he can use them, even though they don't necessarily serve him, but he can fulfill his work through them. God uses flawed and sinful ordinary people, like you and I. God uses flawed and sinful ordinary people like you and I. Christians are forgiven. We're not perfect. We're blameless when we confess our sins before God and we can have our sins washed as white as snow. But we're sinful because we have that sinful nature that we face each and every day. In Daniel 2.21, it says that God changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he will. The question is often asked that if God raises up leaders and brings other leaders down, and if the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, isn't it all predetermined? Why do I need to vote? Well, the question is, he uses us, use human beings as his vehicle to carry out his work and his will. Somewhere between our free will and God's sovereignty, that comes together, and God's plan is to use people, flawed individuals, to fulfill his work. And so he can use wicked kings like Pharaoh to release Israel from slavery and ultimately cause them to get into the promised land, which was a promise that God had made toward Israel. Here's our application. God uses humans that he created to fulfill his purpose on earth, and there is no plan B. He needs us. He could have done it a lot of different ways, but this is the plan that he has laid out for us, is to use us to fulfill his kingdom work. So we have a responsibility. Let's look now at what is the most important point of this message God wants Christ followers to vote on policies and not personalities. He wants us to vote on policies and not personalities. God wants us to look at the biblical issues that have become political. You see, we think we shouldn't get involved because some of these issues that we hear out there on the election trail and purported by the candidates that they hold these things, and we as Christians, we should just stay quiet. But remember that God wrote the Bible long before there was the United States of America. Some of the major issues in the presidential election touch issues in the Bible. Too many pastors and Christians have bought the big lie that we should not get involved in politics. Caroline Woods, in an article, wrote this, the church has not gotten more political, rather politics has gotten more religious. To say otherwise is a lie to silence Christians whom God commanded to speak up. Let's look at some of the issues that overlap the Bible that are front and center with these candidates in our country this election season. I'll share some of them, but in no particular order. First of all, judges. Judges, Isaiah Isaiah 126, and I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Notice if the judges that are appointed do righteous acts, the city will be blessed. Presidents have a lot of power when it comes to appointing federal judges and Supreme Court justices. You've heard it said that elections have consequences. Remember, it was the Democrats when Harry Reid was the Senate Majority Leader in 2013 that took out the filibuster in the Senate when it comes to appointing judges. It now comes down to a simple majority vote of 51 in the Senate to appoint a president's nominated judges or justices. And that's why former President Trump was able to appoint three Supreme Court justices in his term, and it led to Roe versus Wade being overturned and sending it back to the states for the people in those states to make the decision about abortion. As you consider who to vote for in this upcoming election, ask yourself which candidate will appoint the best judges and justices. Second of all, border security. God is in favor of having borders. In Acts 17, verse 26, Paul said, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted 
periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. When the Israelites moved into the promised land, God meticulously laid out in the Old Testament how to divide the territories and made clear the tribe's boundaries. Look at a map, if you would, of Israel in the Old Testament as they moved into the promised land. They had particular boundaries. God defines the boundaries of each tribe. And so if God is for a nation having boundaries and borders, it follows that he wants those boundaries protected. There are 95 scriptures in the Bible talking about immigrants, and they are to be treated with compassion. Zechariah 7.10 says, Do not oppress the widow, the the fatherless, here you go, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. But these sojourners or these immigrants are not to pass through a country's border without doing so in a legal way. See, we should be pro-immigration, which means we welcome people from other countries who follow the process and come into our country legally. For many, it takes years to get their citizenship, and there's even some in our church family who've gone through that process. At least 20 million people have crossed into our country illegally in the last three and a half years. Many are unvetted coming from approximately 180 different countries from around the world. Is it fair to the immigrants that have come here lawfully, let alone the American citizens, that we're talking about giving amnesty to those who've crossed our border in recent years illegally? As a church of Jesus Christ, we need to minister to those who are here legally and illegally. But our job is to share compassion and love toward those who are here illegally, but help them to move toward legal standing. Now, that's a short answer to a very complicated situation. There are nuances, nuances to answer biblically and compassionately, but the world is coming to our doorstep. And those that are here, regardless of their status, need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the influx of illegal immigrants we've experienced recently has become an issue of national security. The question to ask for the candidates running for president is which candidate will do a better job of protecting our country at the border. Thirdly, Israel. Mike Fenley shared about that a few moments ago as he talked in the preceding his prayer time. He mentioned this verse in Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, Israel, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So it says in Psalm 122, 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Bible is clear that we as believers in Christ need to stand for Israel. They have a right to their sovereign land and the right to defend themselves. Now, I'm not saying that everybody in Israel is doing the right thing, that Benton, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and the leadership have made mistakes. There's no doubt about that. There are even many Jewish people in that country who are secular and are not practicing Judaism. But we need to pray for the innocent uh, Israelis who face extinction on a daily basis. At the same time, we need to pray for the innocent Palestinians and Lebanese who are caught in the crossfire with the battle with Hezbollah, Hamas, and other proxy terrorist groups that are supported by Iran. We need to continue to pray for peace in the region and the re- release of more than 100 hostages held by Hamas. Our country needs to be Israel's strongest ally. And so which candidate will show the strongest support for Israel in this time of war? We think of religious liberty. In the Old Testament, there are 613 laws that are based on the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are kind of the summary statement of that. And um, as we think about that, and we look at Exodus 20, verse 3, Exodus 23 is known as the conscience clause. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, why is this the conscience clause? Well, it means if my allegiance... My allegiance is to God alone, and I should not be required to bow down or submit to anything or anyone that would conflict or compete with my allegiance to God. That means doctors who are asked to perform an abortion and refuse to do so based on religious grounds should not be penalized. K. 
cake makers and photographers who choose not to give their services to same-sex marriage weddings should not be penalized. There's a movie coming out, I think it's on October 11th, called Average Joe. Joe Kennedy was a football coach, I believe, in Oregon. He prayed for years, uh, either before or after a game, at the 50-yard line. And finally, somebody complained, and he was fired from his job because he refused to not do that anymore. And, of course, he won in the Supreme Court and won his job back. But no one like that who, who wants to pray by themselves without coercing others to join them should be penalized. So which candidate will stand strong for religious liberty in this election? Number five, biological sex, two genders. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. There are many people in our country who are struggling with gender dysphoria who need help sorting out their issues. And the church and Christian counselors are the place to minister to those people. It means showing messy grace to these people when we talk to them about God's design of what he intended for those made in his image who are giving a gender by God. They need to see that they're made in that image and that they have worth and purpose and living in God's design for the gender that he made them to be. We need to respect their decisions, their choices, but we cannot support or affirm their behavior. This goes against God and his word, and the church is called to preserve marriage and keep it in the confines of one man, one woman for one lifetime, God willing. We need to be teaching our children and teens about why God designed us humans with two genders and what his purpose in doing that was. We cannot follow the ways of our culture and what they are preaching to our young people about sexuality. Booker T. Washington said this, a lie doesn't become truth, wrong doesn't become right, and evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by the majority. Biological boys and men who are transition, transitioning to become women, who want to be in women's locker rooms, who want to play on women's sports team is violating Title IX. So what did the administration do? They changed Title IX to allow for this opportunity for transgender people to play on opposite teams of their actual gender. This should not be so for many reasons, and we don't have time to discuss this here, but which candidate will best follow God's design of biological sex? Two more very quickly, the family. Psalm 127.3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Parental rights are incrementally being taken away. You realize in the state of Minnesota that if you have uh, a parent, a, a mom and a dad and a child, and the child decides they want to uh, transition from a boy to a girl, if one of the parents is opposed to that, it's very possible that the state of Minnesota could come in and take that child away from the family. That's been put into law by Governor Tim Walz. Parents are entrusted with raising their children and not the government. And if the government tries to intrude into the family by taking authority away from the parents and imposing government restrictions on the family, we have to resist this. Which candidate will best stand up for the traditional family and parenting rights in this election. Lastly, and we could do many more issues, but today we'll finish with this one. Sanctity of life versus the murder of unborn babies. Why am I so strong in my language here? Well, I am tired personally of the pro-choice side saying that it's the mother's right to do with her body what she will, and the pro-life side does not point out that abortion is the taking of a human life that was formed to conception made in the image of God. Only God should decide who lives and who dies and when that is. In Acts 3.15, God is called the author of life. In Proverbs 6.17, it says that God hates hands that shed innocent blood. One candidate is for national abortion law that would allow legal abortions up to just before the moment of birth. The other candidate, unfortunately, allows for abortion up to 15 weeks. The Republican platform has been reduced from 1,300 words to 90 words on this issue. 
That's not acceptable. Both candidates have some work to do on this issue to line up with Psalm 139. It says, Therefore you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully amazed. Seth Gruber said this, Those who murder the unborn cannot be trusted to govern the born. That's a powerful statement to think about. So which candidate for the president will protect life? Which candidate? God wants us to vote for the candidate that comes closest, and that's the blank there, the closest to the biblical issues. Most of our elections are a choice between the lesser of two evils. It's true that sometimes you have to hold your nose as you go into the voting booth and vote. But I believe that God gives us the privilege to vote and we have the right to do so and we have a responsibility to go and vote our biblical values. Just remember in World War II, the United States allied with Joseph Stalin, a very evil man in order to conquer Adolf Hitler, an even more evil man. Sometimes you have to choose between the lesser of two evils. So here's the application. Look past the personality of the candidate and look instead at their words and deeds to determine their values and how those values line up with Scripture. That's what you have to look at. Not what they say, but what they've done in the past and what they have done, look at their record before making that decision and see how it lines up with Scripture. Lastly, and very quickly, I believe God wants us to use our right and privilege to vote. In Luke 12, 48, it says, Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. We don't have time to look at the parable of the talents, but you know the story. You know, the owner gave the servants a sum of money. They were to go and multiply that money, invest it, and grow it. All of them did but one, and God blessed those who invested and received more, and those who... Uh, the one who was given the money didn't do anything with it. He took it away from him. We have a responsibility to whom much is given, much is to be required. Very quickly, Christ followers are to use their privileges, privileges to vote in order to help maintain religious freedom. Use our privileges. Christ followers are to use their right, the key word there, right, to vote, to co-labor with God in his work on earth. I'm going to leave you with a couple of verses of scripture to think about and pray about. It says in Psalm 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. In Proverbs 29, 2, When the righteous increase, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, the people groan. I don't know about you, but I'm getting tired of groaning. You want to see righteous people elected. And to be reminded from Edmund Burke, he said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Our application here is dual citizens of heaven and earth. We must exercise our opportunity to vote so that we can be salt and light in the community, or in our country, in our state as well. And God places us here to do that. We're to be salt and light. Key thought here as we close, will you use your one vote as a Christ follower to make a difference in this election season? Ultimately, the answer is not government or elected officials. The answer to America's problem is the need for people to hear about and accept the hope that's found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what ultimately will transform our society one heart at a time. Our country needs revival, and as a recent song I heard on Caleb by Tarion Woods, honestly, we just need Jesus. Psalm 85, 6 says, Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us as we are in this election season. If we're here in Iowa, we're about to have the privilege and the opportunity and the duty to vote. If we live in Illinois, we already have that opportunity. Lord, help us to be praying about how we would vote, thinking through the biblical issues and what the candidates stand for, and help us to make wise choices. And help us not to sit out this election. Every vote counts, and every one of us, we have a responsibility and duty to make our vote count. 
We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.